So as I mentioned, we are beginning this new series today called Why Church? And uh, what I want to do uh, beginning today and then for six Sundays total is we're going to look at things. Um, why do we go to church? Why do you get up on a Sunday morning and, and, and do this? A, a lot of people do it just because they've heard they're supposed to do it, therefore uh, they do it. But, but what about other things? We're going to look today in the Why Church series, we're going to look at the subject of baptism and communion. Now this isn't working. There it goes. Okay. Why do we baptize and why do we celebrate communion at church? Uh, those are good questions. Um, why we serve? Should we serve? Do we serve in the community? Do we serve in church? Do we do both? Do we do neither? Um, why give? Does the Bible say anything about giving? Or should you give? Should you not give? Uh, why do we sing? Uh, why do you have someone like this that stands up here and talks? We're going to answer as many questions as we possibly can in this series on uh, why church. And we're going to begin with the subject of uh, baptism and communion today. And my hope is that we will be greatly encouraged. And then also, when we're done with this series, we're going into the book of Acts. And I'm excited about that because there we're going to learn about the power of the Holy Spirit, the ministering, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because uh, quite frankly, I don't know about you, but I need help from the Holy Spirit. And if you think you don't need help, that's your problem. Good luck with that. But um, uh, living in this world can be discouraging. It can also be a bit of a challenge. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the series right now. And then after that, the book of Acts. Uh, by the way, I want to also remind you that tonight uh, we're back. We're back in the book of Daniel looking at last day's events. And I don't know if you've paid attention to the news. But we have things severely escalating. People are talking about World War III be, uh, with the United States and with Iran and a lot of other players involved. There's a lot of players involved. There's Russia, China, Iran, uh, plus a whole bo a lot of uh, radical Islamic groups on the one side. Uh, the other side is the United States, the UK, um, and Israel. So we're watching these things. I'm going to talk about them tonight. Uh, because I believe we need to be well informed. I also believe that Jesus could come at every, any moment. And uh, man, we need to be ready. And, uh, but what we're moving forward, and right now we're going to talk about why we go to church, why we do these things, specifically why baptize and why celebrate communion. And uh, so the first thing we're going to look at, just these two things, is baptism. And, and with that, I want to look at this from Acts chapter 8. Just going to read a passage. Acts chapter 8. Beginning in verse 26, and the Bible says this, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with Israel, you've been on this road. Uh, not from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, but going the opposite way from Jerusalem toward the Mediterranean. It is all desert out there, and it's in this very place. In fact, Gaza that's listed here in the Bible is the same Gaza that there is today. It's the area, when, when you hear the news that there are missiles that are fired uh, from Gaza toward Israel, towards the Jewish communities, those missiles are landing in the exact area where Philip is going to baptize this Ethiopian eunuch. So that's the spot to help you have some bearings on uh, the, the area and, and what's going on uh, and what was going on then. So Philip is in this area. It's desert between Jerusalem and Gaza. And Philip went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, uh, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. I, I need a teacher. I'm reading the Bible. I don't get it. Um, I, I need a teacher. Hence, we have 412U with how to read and how to study the Bible. Uh, give, give me, I need someone to show me. So Philip does. He gets in the chariot with him. And verse 32 says, the place in the scripture where he read was this. 
that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Then he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Wow, so baptism. Here we have this Ethiopian eunuch, He comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He hears about baptism. Look, there's some water. How about we just do this baptism thing right now? I think he's caught on real quick what the purpose of baptism is. Uh, So with that, let's answer a few questions. Number one, baptism, what is it? I'm going to make this as simple as I can. In church circles, you would call baptism a sacrament. It can also be called an ordinance. It can even be called a ritual. And this this sacrament is something that we still do. Uh, There's two sacraments that are instituted by Jesus. Uh, One of them is this one, baptism. The other one is the one we're going to talk about in just a couple more minutes, and that is communion. Uh, Just before his ascension into heaven, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said this, and this is where Jesus gives us the institution or the sacrament of baptism, tells us to continue it. He said this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. These instructions specify that the church is responsible to teach the word, also to make disciples and to obey the things that Jesus has told us. And here he tells us to baptize disciples. Who's a disciple? A disciple is simply a follower, in this case, a follower of Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a follower of his, then these are the commands. We're we're to uh, be baptizing We're to be teaching and being taught in the word, and we're to obey his word, and we are to do this always. Jesus continued, and he said, surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is saying, do these things, make disciples, teach the word, and baptize until I come again, until the very end of the age. Um, Baptism... Uh, if no other purpose, we are to do it because it's out of obedience to the words of Christ. So we have a baptism as a sacrament. Baptism is also an, ex, uh, an outward expression of the inward conversion. It's the outward expression that inwardly you have received Christ, that you are forgiven, that you are saved, that you are going to heaven. It is the outward expression that on the inside, you have been born again, born of the Spirit. I was talking with a friend of mine who's a Jewish, and he's not a believer in Christ, and we were having some coffee, and uh, we're just talking about uh, Israel, what's going on over there now, uh, talking about the history of the Jewish people. Um, it, It was really, it was a great conversation. And then we were working through things. We came through the time of the New Testament, and I went into this conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus. And I told him, and I said, well, Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again. And he goes, well, where's that? I said, it's in the Bible. He says, that term, born again, it comes from the Bible? I thought it was just a bunch of you crazy people making these things. I said, no, this was Jesus, his own words to Nicodemus, who was one of you. He, he was, he was a, a Jewish Pharisee, a leader. And I said, that's who Nicodemus was. He was one of the rabbis, one of the Pharisees. And Jesus told him, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. 
Baptism is simply the outward expression of what took place on the inside. Now, with that, baptism began um, way before the days of John the Baptist. You want a little bit more history? Well, good, because even if you don't want it, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a little bit more history. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 17, way back in the days of Moses, you first see baptism come into play. Did you know that? So in the days of Moses, Leviticus chapter 16, the priest was told, before you go into the place of the Holy of Holies, you've got to go into, you, you, you've got to be cleansed of water. Uh, what the priest had to do was take off his garment, go into the water. It was a ritual cleansing and be cleansed by the water before you put on your holy priestly garments and go into the holy place. You must go through the immersion of the water. That was way back 1,500 years before John the Baptist. Uh, in fact, if you go over to Israel today, you will see this. This is called a mikvah. Um, these mikvahs are 2,000 years old, 2,500 years old. You see steps going down into this, this uh, cistern, and, and this was specifically for Jews to go into this mikvah, be filled with water. This wasn't a cistern for drinking. It was a mikvah, a ritual bath. They go into this water before they would ascend up to the area of the temple. Um, here's another one. You can see the, the steps going down uh, into what would have been uh, water at that time. And so they had this purpose of, um, of uh, th the need to uh, purify themselves. I find it interesting that you look at the days of the, the Jews all the way back before the days of John the Baptist. They had to go through a baptism go into the mikvah to be cleansed before they go to the Holy of Holies. You fast forward to the days of John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist, the one who, who baptized Jesus. You fast forward to the days of John the Baptist, 1,500 years later, John the Baptist says, hey, that, that mikvah you go into to ascend the Holy of Holies, that's not good enough. John's baptism, if you remember, was the baptism of repentance. Remember that? So John is saying, look, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You guys go into the baptismal, the mikvah, you go up to the temple, up to the holy place, and you say, I'm good to go, but you have never repented of your sins. John, John called them when he was in the wilderness at the Jordan, when he was baptizing people, he called the religious leaders who would not be baptized, baptized with the baptism of repentance. He called them hypocrites because they ascended the temple. They only went through the ritual. There was no heart conviction in the baptism that they were going through. So you go from, uh, from the baptism of the priests in Leviticus to the baptism of John the Baptist. And then that takes us to the baptism that we have today, the Christian baptism. So we have baptism, what is it? Baptism, how do we do it? Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity, that's what Jesus said. There's another passage in the, in the New Testament that says, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, entire denominations have formed based upon how you, the words you use when you baptize somebody. So if I say, if I follow the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 28, and, and I'm baptizing you, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, put you under the water, pull you back up, some people will say, well, that's no good. The Bible says, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So other churches form say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they baptize and pull the person back up. You go, this is just crazy to start whole churches over this. Uh, Chuck Smith the founder of Calvary Chapels, he found a solution to it. Uh, he's tired of taking shots from both sides. So he goes, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, ch -ch -ch, in the name of Jesus Christ. So he covered both faces, and, uh, <laughs> and that was done. I typically stick with baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Also, baptism is... Um, it comes from a Greek word, baptizo or baptizo. It means to immerse. Uh, it means to submerge. 
it also means to overwhelm. So some churches teach that you baptize by sprinkling with water. Uh, but the baptism in the Bible, it is, listen, it's a full dunk. Uh, when we go to Israel, uh, we always do baptisms. And um, there's a picture, this is in the Jordan River. Some people on one of our trips that were baptized. And uh, it's very dirty, can you tell? <laughs> it is. This place, in fact, this was the last time I went to this place to baptize anybody. It's just, it's just, it just got too bad, uh, really. Uh, right behind there, you see the reeds behind us? That's Jordan. Uh, the Jordan River at that point is only probably as wide as this set of chairs right here. Uh, and uh, so, um, but we were baptizing there. The water was dirty. Now uh, we go over to this area for the baptism. This is near the Sea of Galilee, just below the Sea of Galilee. And uh, that's one of our ushers coming out of the water there. And, uh, but it's a full immersion. And here, at this place, they make you wear a white robe, too. I guess they want it to be somewhat authentic. And what's interesting, this place here is believed by almost all scholars to be the place where Jesus really was baptized by John the Baptist. That's why as stinky and as gross as the water is in that spot, uh, people still go to it. But as far as I can see, no moss am I going to that place. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm done with this. Um, but we are to be baptized. We are to be in the process of uh, uh, baptizing one another. So baptism, what is it? Number two, baptism, how do we do it? Uh, last question, baptism, why do we do it? John the Baptist used baptism to prepare the way of the Lord, requiring everybody, not just Gentiles, to be baptized because everyone needs repentance. I already talked about that, right? You have the baptism in the book of Leviticus, which was for the priest to ascend to the holy place. Then you have the baptism of John the Baptist says, whoa, 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 you guys need to repent before you even go into the holy place. So we have the holy place, baptism of priests. The everybody needs a baptism of repentance to the Christian baptism. The Christian baptism symbolizes all three of those things. Because you're in Christ, you have the opportunity to go into the holy place with the Lord, even in your prayers. Did you know that? Um, because you're a Christian, uh, it's a, it, it, it takes us from the holy place to the repentance to a baptism of belief. John's baptism wasn't a baptism of belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, John the Baptist even said, at one point he was wondering if Jesus was the Messiah. He had already been baptizing people for repentance. He had to ask, are you the Messiah? For the Christian, the full understanding, which now we have because of the word of God, it's a baptism of repentance and a baptism of belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian baptism is the means by which a person makes a public profession of faith and discipleship. In the waters of baptism, a person uh, says, whether with words or with attitude, I confess faith in Christ. Jesus has cleansed my soul from sin, and now I have a new life. I am one of his. In baptism, we identify with Christ. I belong to the King of Kings. I belong to the Lord of Lords. I am one of his children. In baptism, we are saying, I am his. Christian baptism illustrates in a dramatic style the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And at the same time, it also illustrates our death to sin and our being raised to new life. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So in baptism, we dunk. Uh, some people need to be dunked for longer. I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but, so, some people I threaten, I need to hold you down three times. <laughs> I have one lady ask me if she could hold her, if, if I could hold her husband down longer. Um, <laughs> so I did, I obliged. Um, but in baptism, you go down and you come up. It signifies dying to sin, raised to new life. It signifies your repentance, right? It also signifies cleansing, 
Right? You've been washed by the Lord. Um, it also signifies we will die, but then one day, because of Jesus, we will rise to new life in heaven. Why get baptized? Um, because the Bible tells us to. So we identify with Christ, but also the Bible tells us to. Very simply, baptism is an outward testimony of the inward change in a believer's life. Christian baptism is an act of obedience to the Lord after salvation. Listen, baptism does not save you. Repentance and asking Christ to forgive you, that's what saves you. The Holy Spirit comes in into your life. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are born again. You're born of the Spirit. The Spirit makes this dwelling place in you. You are saved at that point. But baptism is an outward expression of all that that took place. Does that make sense? Now, here's the thing with baptism. Um, although it doesn't save me, does God love me less if I'm not baptized? No. Let, let me give you an example. I have two kids, right? They're both teenagers. Anybody else familiar with teenagers? Does anybody have a teenager that's ever been disobedient? Okay, now I'm going to ask another question. Were any of you ever teenagers that were disobedient? And do not lie, because you'll be a disobedient as an adult. All right. So we get it. So here's the thing. I tell my daughter, I tell my son, uh, do this, wash the dishes, take out the trash, or uh, whatever it is. Uh, Clean up your room. Please. Please. How many times do I got it? You know, that whole thing, right? Um, and uh, I don't love them less because they didn't do the dishes, right? I still love them. But when they do these things because they should do these things, right, um, it, it, it's an expression of their love toward me, it's also an expression that they are growing up. It's an expression that they are maturing. Baptism, listen, you are not saved because you are baptized or not baptized. Um, but we get baptized because we're supposed to. In fact, to not be baptized is a disobedience to the Lord. To not be baptized is rebellion against what the Lord would have you do. Have you ever thought of that? Here's the crazy thing about it. Baptism is the most basic of all things a Christian is supposed to do. Yet I talk to Christians all the time, I don't need to be baptized, I'm going to. You don't need to, but if you can't be obedient in the most basic thing, how can you possibly be obedient and faithful? You say you're faithful to the Lord. Well, if you can't be faithful in this, that makes it rather difficult. And it is an expression that I am maturing in my faith in Christ. Does it make sense? But he still loves us just as much. I still love my kids. I don't kick them out of the house. I just wish they would grow up and do these things. So we have baptism. Second one is communion. This one is much shorter. But with communion, uh, just a few things to address. Um, like baptism, communion, what is it? Uh, communion comes from the Last Supper, the institution of communion, the sacrament of communion, the ordinance of communion, the ritual of communion, whatever it is you want to call it. It was at the Last Supper, the night that Jesus was betrayed. Remember that night? So Jesus is betrayed. Judas has left the room. Jesus takes the bread. He breaks off some. He passes it around to his disciples. And he says, take, eat. This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The thing that's interesting about the bread and the cup is I was taught uh, in the religious system that I grew up in that the bread literally turned into the body of Jesus, and the cup literally turned into the blood of Jesus. It did not. It's symbolic. Uh, even at the time of Jesus, he's sitting there, the bread itself that he passed around did not turn into the body of Jesus, right? It was symbolic of his body that would be put on the cross. Jesus is the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. Um, also, at the Last Supper, Jesus passed around the cup filled with wine. Now, in, in our church, we use grape juice, I'm just saying. And we also pass around, we don't want to pass around a loaf of bread, because that would, but we have these cups that are highly annoying. Does anybody agree with me? Here's the deal. <laughs> we live in a world that freaks out over getting sick. And you pass around bread and cups, and people don't want to touch anything anymore. And that's why we have these. Now, we've made them almost easy to open. Almost, but probably not. So here it is, or right, just giving you a demonstration now. Uh, if you bend the, the top down and then up, it should separate. This one worked. Generally, they don't work. It takes me like one out of 100 to actually work, but, but you get it, right? Either way, the principle is here. We have the bread that is symbolic of Jesus. We take this in remembrance of him. We have the cup that is symbolic of his blood because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, again, Jesus was doing this at the Last Supper, passed around the bread, passed around the cup of wine. Where did that actually come from? Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, if you've been at this church for over a year, you've been through this part with me before, but the Passover, 1,500 years before Jesus, it's the time of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. They're going to go into the promised land. They're going to cross through the Red Sea. And there's a final judgment that's going to come upon Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And the Jews are told through Moses, this is what you need to do. You need to take a lamb and you need to sacrifice that lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts that enter into your house, up above and then also on the sides. And, and uh, by the way, the blood of the lamb was to be in the center part. It would be collected down there at the, at the, at the base of the door. There would be a little uh, a trench that was there for the blood. The, the lamb represented Jesus who was to come. The blood represented his blood that was going to be shed. The blood that was put at the doorpost represented the cross. Now, here's the thing. The Lord told the people of the, the Jewish people, he said, everybody who has the blood of the lamb covering their house, covering their doorpost, entering into their house, every single house that has the blood of the lamb covering their entrance into the house, that house will be passed over from death, and they will have life. Hence the term Passover. The Last Supper and communion. Uh, the Last Supper was a remembrance of the original Passover in the days of Moses. When we partake of communion, it is a reminder that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb, that we are covered, that death has passed us over that we are forgiven, and when we die, we will raise to new life. So we have the, the bread, and we have the cup. We have them both. And by the way, with the blood being collected at the basin of the door, and the doorpost representative of the cross, it's a reminder of Jesus on the cross that the blood drips straight down. So the whole thing, it was all imagery of Jesus who was coming, but for us with communion, it's a reminder of Jesus who came and forgave us of our sins. That's why we do this in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Simple enough? Okay. So communion, what is it? Uh, number two, second question. No more questions after this. Uh, communion, why do we partake of it? This is real simple. Just like baptism. Ready? Because the Bible tells us to. So the Bible says. In fact, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible tells us this. It's the Apostle Paul. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So again, when we partake of communion, we are doing it in remembrance of what Christ has done for us, that we are forgiven. And then in the same manner, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we partake of the bread, we partake of the cup 
all in remembrance of what Jesus, the Passover lamb, has done for us. And then this goes on and says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember what he's done. We're also told we remember that he's coming again. Amen. And it is an amen. And then it says this, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Ouch! But actually, this is really good, all right? Why do we uh, partake of communion? Um, because the Bible tells us to, and also because we are forgiven. Here's the deal. This says if you partake of communion in an unworthy manner, it's going to be a problem for you. That's talking about examining your heart. But then, that very last verse I read, it says this. But let a man examine himself, and a woman would apply here, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I have Christians often will tell me, Pastor Tom, I have really messed up, so I can't take of communion. You know what I say? You are really messed up. That's why you need to partake of communion. <laughs> communion, we do it in remembrance of him. Because we are messed up people. I have never, I, I'm sure some people think so, but listen, in the, since we partook of communion as a congregation last month, I am sure I've messed up at least once. I've driven down Florida Avenue and got mad at people. What I probably shouldn't have. Anybody else? All right, so right, we, we mess up. We do not use our mess ups as an excuse to not partake of communion. It is exactly the opposite. Because you messed up and because you are a mess up, right? That is why we take of communion. So when we have the bread and the cup in our hands, we say, Lord, examine me. Lord, make me right. I am a foul up. And strengthen me that I would be better. We're in a new year. It's 2020. What a great idea, right? Starting off a new year, reading your Bible all the time, saying, Lord, I need to make the spiritual commitment to you. And... and uh, we are told in that verse, let a man examine himself and take communion. The assumption is, out of obedience to the Lord, a mature Christian is going to recognize, you know what, when the communion elements come around, if I've been messing up, Lord Jesus, forgive me, and then you partake of communion. That's how this unrolls. And again, since we're in the beginning of a new year, we say, Lord, help me. Help me in this year to be better than I was last year in the spiritual sense. Does that make sense? Amen.